Hello and welcome to another edition of Backstage Pass. My guests today are Steve Terry and John McGraw. Steve is the Vice President of Research and Development for ETC. And John, who appears to be retired, but is actually a, a very supportive member of the live entertainment community, especially for ESTA, the Entertainment Services and Technology Association. Morning, gentlemen. Morning. Morning, Bill. Thank you for joining me. We want to have a conversation today about the lighting industry as it began in the early 70s and proceeded through to where we are today. Uh, you guys were certainly involved in the beginnings of that through your own endeavors and through um, uh, production arts in particular, which is where my interests lie today, I think more than anything else. So I'd like to start with getting an idea of where you guys came from, uh, how you got started, that sort of thing. So Steve, if, if you could give us an idea of what got you into the business? Yeah. Well, I think it's sort of the classic tale of finding the theater in, during school. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to have, as teachers in my junior high school, uh, a local 829 lighting designer, who was the art teacher in my, high, in my junior high school, mm -hmm. and a director who was interested in the theater, who was an English teacher. And so there was a lot of production going on in my school career. and. Then when I got into high school, uh, the, my last summer of high school, I got a job as an electrician at a summer stock theater of, uh, in upstate New York. And then I kind of proceeded from there to half-heartedly go to college for a while and then decided rapidly that wasn't for me. And I got a job as the electrician with the Dance Theater of Harlem. So I was on tour with them for about five or six years. Gary Fales was the stage manager and and Carpenter, and I was the electrician, and we toured the world. Now, while I was doing that part-time, I was dropping in to see my friends John uh, McGraw and Peter Forward at Production Arts Lighting uh, on East 10th Street in Manhattan. So I had a part-time gig working there while I was in town from the Dance Theater of Harlem. Right. How, uh, did you, how did you hook up with the Dance Theater of Harlem? That's how did that come about? Story. Okay, so when I went to City College for my first semester and my last semester, as it turned out, <laughs> I looked at the catalog and I said, oh, look, uh, a stagecraft course, three easy credits, because I just finished summer stock, so I know what I'm doing there. So the instructor of that was a guy named Peter Forward, who was actually uh, one of the original partners of Production Arts Lighting. And what, at one point he said, oh, there's a gig... The Dance Theater of Harlem is performing at Hunter College. They need a crew, anybody interested. And I was like, yeah, okay. So the Dance Theater of Harlem was there, and they had a, they had a, a new or new-ish electronic dimming system that was not working. So I spent the take in repairing that. And after they, that happened, they said, well, how would you like to go on tour? I said, done. <laughs> and so my college career lasted from September to December. And I jumped in a trunk truck and went on tour with ETH. Right. So you were what, 18, 19, 20 yeah, years old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Excellent. Yeah, 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 yeah. You grew up in Rochester, I believe? Uh, eventually, yeah, right. Uh, eventually. <laughs> yeah, around Detroit. Okay. Uh, very similar. Uh, my best friend in high school, sister, was a dancer. They needed some help doing theater. We started doing technical theater my freshman year. Uh, it turned out... We, like Steve, we had a really good instructor who wanted to do a lot of theater. We even started our own summer stock program for the, at the high school that ran the four years that I was there. Uh, and there were a number of us in very interested in technical theater, and we would not only do the stuff at the high school, but we would then hire ourselves out as a crew to do the community theater groups. I mean, there were three or four in Rochester. So, I mean, by the time I left high school, I'd done about 100 different productions in varying positions of, across the board. Originally, my mother and father thought theater would make a wonderful hobby for me. <laughs> and so I originally went to the University of Rochester as a chemical engineering major, but they had a theater department that was run by the students. So 
by the end of the first semester, I was the business manager for the theater department that ran the theater, was doing, continuing to do the work for my community theater groups, plus doing all the stuff at the University of Rochester. I lasted a little bit longer than you. <laughs> I went through one full semester and then halfway through the second semester at the University of Rochester, left school and when my grades came and my parents figured out what was going on, uh, I got a job doing my first paid summer stock, $35 a week. And right. then, yeah, right. Wow, I had you beat. <laughs> DTH was $75. Oh, well, I got a raise before the end of the summer to 50 But But $75 a week at $5 a day per diem, and they <laughs> picked up the hotel. Oh. Oh. I was rich. You were rich. <laughs> you were rolling. I was, rolling I was rich. <laughs> I, fi I figured out after my first summer stock job, I figured out what my <coughs> hourly rate was, and, and I never did that again. I never want to figure that out. Yeah. Just, but then it was about 27 cents an hour or something along those lines. Well, the producer for the summer stock theater was doing a bus and truck tour of Stop the World, I Want to Get Off that fall. Mm -hmm. So I continued on and I was, depending upon who you asked, I was either the stage manager or the electrician, and I drove the truck. Right. Uh, we came down, we actually rehearsed at the Lambs Club in right. Manhattan, mm -hmm. and then toured through Dece late December, early January, and I was about to get drafted, I got my draft notice, and so the producer had also taught at Ithaca College, he called his friends, I got enrolled to do theater program at Ithaca College starting in the spring semester. And uh, I started off, Peter Forward was one of my instructors. Right. Um, I was taking the stagecraft, like you, I was taking the stagecraft course, and I was teaching the lab in the course at the same time. So I, I lasted there two and a half years. Two and a half. Before, before I left. Right. Okay. Good. Ended up touring, then did, got drafted, spent two years in the Army, or one year, nine months, and three days. But, but who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> and actually got out of the Army early because Production Arts Studio, Peter Forward had left Ithaca and had gone to New York and was at uh, City College? City College. City yeah. College. And had started a company building scenery with two other students from Ithaca and then someone from, he knew from Charlotte, North Carolina, where he had done summer stock himself. So they had production arts studio, and they got me uh, a job, technically, that was a seasonal job building scenery for Off-Broadway, and it got me out of the Army three months early. Uh, of course, the Off-Broadway strike happened that fall, so I ended up going out to San Diego and picking up another tour, right. and didn't come to New York until the following fall. And that's when we started Production Arts Lighting. Right. So touring seemed to be a big part of both of your early careers. So what brought you off the road and got you into the city? John? Well, Peter Forward had asked me if I wanted to start a lighting business. I had rented the producer that I worked summer stock with. I had, he had his own equipment. And I used to rent that at Ithaca College and then would hire Peter as my crew to help me do things. So. When I left Summerstock in the fall of 71, I guess it was, um, I brought the equipment down to New York and we started Production Arts Lighting. Right. And Clark Thornton, Dan Blyer, Ted Harris didn't want to participate, so it was just Peter and myself. Uh, I borrowed $5,000 from my parents. Steve borrowed, or uh, Peter borrowed $5,000 to renovate his apartment, supposedly. And we used that to buy the first set of Lico's and auto transformer dimmers that we got from Altman. Right. Um, and the idea was that I was going to work on shows on Broadway at night and we would do the lighting business during the day and it was going to be a little sideline for us. We didn't realize what it was going to become. Right. right. And you came off the road. Yeah, I mean the, the Dance Theater of Harlem did basically run out tours so they weren't on the road all the time. Sure. So that when I was in town their shop was right around the corner on Avenue D between 7th and 8th Street. And Production Arts was on 10th Street between C and D. So I would kind of double dip going back and forth <laughs> to my part-time job at Production Arts and my full-time job 
with DTH. And then it got to the point where the workload at Production Arts was significant enough that it was time to make it a full-time job. And as I said to you before, I was offered uh, a basically a $10 a week salary cut from right. my salary at DTH to come and work full-time at Production Arts, right. and that's when I did that. Right. But we made you a better deal later. Oh, we'll get to that later, okay. yeah. <laughs> What was, what did you think was going to happen? Was it, were there goals at that stage of the game? Or was this, well, what's this? Production Arts Studio was building scenery for off-Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that we would try and do the lighting for the same shows at the same time. I mean, we went up to Altman and bought a dozen Lecos and one six by auto transformer board back in the day. It was the first order and started from there. I mean, we. We, we happened to start at the change of technology in the lighting industry. One of the first times that we went to buy cable, we actually ordered 14.2 and 12.2 and realized we were making a mistake. And we then returned all that and bought three wire cables. So everything from the very beginning was grounded. Right. I mean, in the early days, we had more two pin to three pin adapters because nobody else was running grounded cable. Right. Uh, but we did that very, very early on in the, in the industry. Okay. And that change in technology is, of course, kind of what sucked me into production arts. Because there was that move from manual auto transformer dimmers to electronic dimming. Mm -hmm. And somebody needed to kind of deal with that, both keeping it working and deciding what you know, accessories and power distribution needed to go with it. So, you know, having been on the road with DTH where basically a lot of the stuff I did was build equipment because we were too dumb to know that you didn't do that. Like if you had a problem <laughs> and you couldn't buy the equipment, well, you built it. Right. So we had a shop where we were doing a lot of electronic construction of equipment. So that, that transferred pretty well into the needs of production arts right at that moment. And I, th and I think our production experience combined right. uh, put us in a good place to understand what electricians and off-Broadway theaters or touring or whatever they were doing would need because we'd both been there right. and done it and we knew the best ways to solve the problem. Right. We were the first shop in New York to color code the cable for length. Nobody had done it before that. Right. You would be when you got equipment on when I was loading in Broadway shows you'd, you'd count the loops to try and guess how long the cable was and hope that it was long enough to make mm -hmm. the run that you had to do you didn't know right. how long it was going to be <laughs> yeah the state of the art in rental lighting equipment in the early 70s was shockingly bad right. even because, for the day yeah yeah because first of all I mean the, there was the technology don't forget Broadway was 100% using resistance 14-plate piano boards mm -hmm. for control. You know, there was cable in, 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 their, in the inventory of the Broadway theater that was, you know, from the 40s and 50s. Uh, so, and, and the norm was uh, incandescent, not quartz, incandescent light sources, very inefficient, you know, uh, and, and so it, it offered a great opportunity for production arts to kind of leap ahead in our off-Broadway market, a leap ahead a little bit on the technology to, to quartz sources, to electronic dimming equipment, and the like. And we also were, I think at that time, the only shop in the off-Broadway market that was we would trim every leco every time it went out the door so that we you know you got a fixture that was maximized its light output the right. filaments were there were no hot spots or right. stuff like that yeah i mean i think that's what kind of set production arts apart from the very beginning was the equipment was consistently great and we adopted a customer service model that was very much pro customer and pro-design community. Right. So those two things kind of gave us a, a, a good push forward. 
In, in addition to that, because at least with my experience is that there is, has been um, an event or a show or something that really kind of put you on the map or put you over the top. Now, yeah. with the technological uh, approach that you had, you were already kind of going down that road. But was there any event or a show that, that yeah. made it for you, or at least you could point to and go, that's, that's the start? Yeah, I think so. There was, a, there was a trajectory started by the fact that we uncovered a market in touring bus and truck productions. And up until that point, bus and truck tours, you know, carried 50 to 100 lights, 24 dimmers, 48 dimmers maybe, but small rigs that could be put up in one day. And Jules said, I'm only going to do this show. I'm going to make some concessions and cut the show to 300 lights. Right? So there, <laughs> the producer was faced with, how are we going to do this? Right. Right? And that resulted in some really sort of innovative new packaging technology that allowed pre-hung structures. Uh, Dancing was a very heavy side light show for, because it was a dance production. Sure, sure. And so we designed and constructed side lighting towers that could be pre-hung and broken down into sections and rolled onto the truck with the lights hanging in them and other pre-hung solutions and we introduced multi-conductor cable multi-cable which is now you know a, yeah, sure. a you know a, a fact of life but right. then was radical <laughs> so we went from bundles of cable this big to multi cables this big right? right and that so that technology sort of set us on a path to becoming known as uh, a company that could do that kind of packaging and make touring much more efficient for the for producers. Right. And I think, I mean, the the other issue that came came up with the towers is we also designed them so that you could climb on them and focus them. You didn't yeah, need to right. carry a ladder right. to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we did the Unistrut carts that had the the horizontal pipes broken into four ten foot sections. Again, breakouts and multi cable running to them. Sure. The place a U on the top of the Unistrut to hold the cable so you didn't have to tie the cable to the to the pipe. All these things just made the load in go that much faster. And then we worked with the various dimming manufacturers too to get boards and dimming uh, packages that were really designed for touring that yes. happened. So we designed a the first uh, touring high density dimmer rack. Basically went to small dimmers of 2.4 kW. Mm -hmm. That sounds radical, right? <laughs> and then it was radical, right? right? Mm -hmm. Dimmer per circuit kind of arrangement mm -hmm. and 96 dimmers in a touring rack. And we contracted with Lighting Methods in Rochester, New York to build the dimmers themselves. And then we designed the rest of the rack, the power distribution, the the actual physical package and the, and patch, that, pa and the patch, and pa patch panel. Yeah, the, this, this now allowed you to take then a 12 circuit multi cable, plug it into the rack and have it all pre patched to the right place every right. time, right? So a big, huge reduction in labor. We also built that five seam oh, modular yeah. preset. Oh, that, yeah. With the Dipless crossfader. Did you ever see that? I, I never they, saw that. That was no. a big, big thing because control-wise, there's no such thing as a portable computer system. Right. 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 So you basically were limited to two scene preset manual controllers, right? And we said, well, this isn't going to work because even before we got into high density, big dimmer racks, you know, these systems were growing to be 72, 96 dimmers, and that just couldn't be dealt with on a two-scene preset console. So we designed and manufactured a modular five-scene preset console, which basically would go from in blocks of 24 channels up to 96 channels with a split dipless crossfader and a lot of advanced kind of features. 
And that, again, catapulted us in the, in the, in the bus and truck market. They were built to last for 40 years. They were. They definitely were. <laughs> we, we, we still, remember how Bob C. used to build everything in oak, with right. the heavy-duty sure. oak? Sure. Well, we built the cases and the racks out of very nice oak. Mm -hmm. uh, we By this time, we'd moved up to 11th Avenue and had hired various people who were had different skill sets, you know, Wally Johnson and Terry Richardson in the fabrication department you know, built the towers and stuff for us, right. and built the, yeah. did the woodworking for all of the touring stuff. Yeah, and by the way, the oak wasn't for uh, cosmetic reasons. It was because it, it couldn't be shaved apart by get bumping into other crates on yeah, the right. truck. <laughs> right, so exactly. it lasted, wear forever. Out. It lasted yeah. forever, yeah. right. <laughs> so you took that tech, so you took your production experience, your touring pr experience, and started production arts and moved it forward because of that and paying attention to the needs of the touring market and you know, production electricians everywhere. Well, and one of the things that I always wanted to do is that we, when we started doing off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway, we had designers at an early stage in their career and we maintained the relationships and tr continued to try and solve the problems as they would improve in their careers so that as designers would move up and find more interesting and bigger budgets mm -hmm. to do, we would try and find the solutions that made production easier for them right. as we were going forward. Sure. I, I still have designers coming up to me today and they, they, they talking about, first of all, where is production arts? We miss you. Now, <laughs> mind you, it's 98 since we sold the company right. to uh, PRG, right. so it's nearly 20 years. Yeah. Then they say, 489-0312. That was the <laughs> phone number, right? And then some of them will say, like, um, you really helped my career. Me? How did I help your career? Well, I had no money. And I said, I, I said to you, I got a show where there are enough lights on the show that I have to have a computer, but I can't afford it. And so we subsidized that, you right. know. And that... You know, that kind of thing came around forever because we developed extremely loyal clients. Sure, right. sure. What caused production arts to be and, and be so successful at that particular time? And what's it look like moving forward? Would it happen today? Part of what happened is that the technology change happened just in the early 70s coming into the 80s. We made investments in the new technology every time mm -hmm. that we could. Uh, the, I mentioned the $5,000 I borrowed, $5,000 that Peter borrowed. Today, if you tried to start a company on $10,000, you could buy one light right. or something. Right. You just yeah. couldn't do it. Right. Um, it would be much more difficult. Um, we had the advantage of having the ability to make money on Broadway at night and live on that. Right. I didn't take money out of production arts lighting until 1979, eight years after I started the company. Sure. I'd worked on Broadway. Right. Um, I was the electrician and then master electrician on Greece, and then hired Peter as my assistant. Um, you know, some people used to joke that Greece was the show that built production arts. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was, you know, as, as Steve said, you know, that was auto. Tr or, Auto Transformers when we were at the Broadhurst Theater, then Resistance Dimmers when we moved to the Royale Theater. Right. Uh, and had to deal with that. Which, you, you know, that technology change is happening so fast now, and the price tag is so high, it'd be very hard for somebody to start their own business unless somebody left them a million dollars, and then it would probably be underfunded. Right. But production arts managed to stay alive for a, a long period, relatively speaking, a long period of time. You sold the business in 98, correct? Correct. What the technology changes along that period, you managed to keep up with? Yeah, because one of the things, one of my strengths, where Steve's strength was in the design and technical issues for electronic dimming and all of those aspects, doing the books and finding the banker and convincing the banker to lend us money. That right. was my strength right. in that part of the business. So 
we changed as time went on. Right. And, you know, and if you want to go to the end game, I mean, we, in the four years prior to our selling, we had five different offers, if I remember right, from various players where they wanted the, the system that we had developed, the, the, uh, the ability to deal with technology and to deliver it to people. They wanted that for their, for their portfolio. And everybody had a lighting company already, but they wanted to add production arts in right. to, to the mix because we had a different mix than almost anybody else. Sure. You know, one thing we haven't touched on is Production Arts was basically two companies at the end of its life. Uh, and for the maybe seven or eight years prior to that, or maybe more. As um, the, rental, the rental company proceeded, and then I became interested in working on uh, design and installation and project management of permanently installed lighting systems around various parts of the market. So we got involved in many projects in Las Vegas, projects in Paris. We, so we were basically running two, two operations, the rental operation and the systems group. Uh, and they were pretty separate in what they did, but they were very complementary. Because as business cycles went up and down, you had the relatively low margin systems installation work the relatively high margin uh, rental operation and the business cycles of those two complemented each sure. other, right? So. As a rental company, when the automated lights started to come into the market mid 80s, what was, what was Production Arts' response to that? Were you, did you get involved in it with the, from the rental side? We did, yeah. 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 We, uh, I would say, you know, it wasn't actually mid-80s. It was, it was probably a little later than that. Yeah. But the actual, the, the product that was available to purchase that was actually going to work reliably was kind of thin on the ground in the yeah. early days, right? Yeah. You had Verilite, who was strictly a rental operation. Right. And our first, in fact, our only purchases of automated lighting were from high-end systems. Right. What was your reaction? I was just curious what your reaction was when they first, when or I remember my first reaction to seeing a Verilite on, on a stage, and I was curious what your reaction might be. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, you had the fact that it moved, the fact that it instantly changed to any saturated color that you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, I mean, Jim Bornhorst invented a sea change with the sure. VL1, you know, and everything flowed from there. Right. And it was, it was an amazing, uh, amazing difference and an amazing change in the requirements for control, power distribution, sure. every aspect of the system. Right. So. Good, good. Yeah, I mean, my, my first impression was that it was going to be good for concert type of productions, but at the time it was first came out, that the color saturation and the color palette really wouldn't lend itself that well to many theatrical productions. Right. So the, the, the rise of automated equipment and the control and powering needs for all that, it probably brought on, as I understand it, a higher need for control protocols, which is where kind of DMX came from. Yeah, and, and you know, actually it goes back a little before automated yeah. lighting uh, was on the scene because all the automated lights has had their own proprietary protocols, but that was no problem because they were proprietary companies making the lights and the controllers. But around 1984, 1985, Production Arts had another problem, which was we had a rise of different manufacturers of dimming equipment and control equipment, and they didn't talk to each other. So we had this mess of black boxes, and these were not black boxes with just different connectors on the input and output. They had microprocessors in them. They did protocol translation. And as we moved to multiple manufacturers of control consoles, it fell to the rental companies to try to make all this work together. And it was really an untenable situation. So in the uh, spring of 1986, a bunch of us got together at a presentation at the USITT conference and basically said, 
to the manufacturers of control and dimming equipment. That's it, guys. Figure it out so that all this stuff can talk to each other because we're not going to bear the cost of this. So in, in, uh, in the, in the uh, summer of 1986, we were able to put together a draft standard called BMX 512, which of course we all know now what that means and what it's meant to our industry. For us at PA, it was easy. On Monday morning, we said, okay, we're changing every piece of dimming and control equipment to DMX 512. Change the connectors, change the, the electronics, and we're done. We learned early on that DMX 512 is a terrible standard. It's technically not very sophisticated. It has a lot of shortcomings from a technical point of view. It doesn't have error checking. None of that mattered. Why? Because there was only one feature of that standard that was useful, interoperability. You know, the European community, w were, they were kind of the first to see uh, DMX 512 beyond dimmers and consoles. Moving light manufacturers that you'd never heard of, Clay Packy, Pulsar, all of these people that have decided to take the DMX 512 standard and put it in their equipment. So it started showing up in color scrollers, projection equipment, automated lights, lots of things other than dimmers and consoles. And so that, that got the ball rolling and created, arguably, billions, and I mean multiple billions with a B, billions of dollars of uh, revenue for different companies in our industry over the last 25 years. All because of that one thing, interoperability. Right. I mean, I, I remember when Steve first started talking about this, I ideally wanted to get rid of all those black boxes. And the way we were discussing it in the company was it was a way to a minimum communication between Manufacturer A's console and manufacturer B's dimmers or any number of different combinations. And it was, the idea was that it wasn't going to maybe have all the bells and whistles that Strand's console to dimmer protocol had, but it would be functional to, to run the dimmers and the console. And you could switch back and forth from a Kaligal console to a Strand dimming system or vice versa, stuff like that. When did the TDA start, the Theater Theatrical Dealers Association? Oh, God. I don't remember. It would have been in the late 80s. Late 80s. Glenn Becker, Frank Stewart, um, San Diego Stage and Lighting. Right. That's where Lori got involved. All were involved. Um, Production Arts was not involved the very first year, but we joined shortly thereafter. Right. And I think together we realized that, well actually it was actually three or four years later, I'll take that back, is when the transition from TDA, which was really a dealer's association, right. into ASTA, which is when the manufacturers were brought in, because the manufacturers wanted the ability to develop standards and things like that. And they needed a nonprofit where they could legally meet, discuss issues, and move forward. John Offord uh, from Plaza was very instrumental because some of the U.S. manufacturers had gone to him wanting to see if Plaza wanted to do this. And he said to them, you've got a perfectly good association in the United States. You should work with, with them. And that's when the TDA, Theatrical Dealers Association, transitioned itself into the Entertainment Services and Technology Association and started the Technical Standards Program, later on the Certification Program, all of these things which we as a company felt was the best way that we could move the industry forward uh, by donating both time and money and expertise to make it a safer place for everybody to work. And I mean, who knew? You know, my, I had one interest, was, which was let's do control uh, interoperability standards. But yeah, that just has, has mushroomed and did mushroom early on into many, many other rigging standards, for instance, your own involvement in that. Sure. Uh, 
major, a major uh, force in our industry. Mentoring has always been an important component to the entertainment industry. And I was wondering what kind of a role production arts played in that with you know, the people coming up, the people working within your organization. Yeah, I think that there are, I mean, I can think of five or six people right now who have a, important careers in the industry who learned how to walk and talk at production arts. I mean, absolutely, John. That's the, in, so what, in production arts was the incubator in the New York scene for young production people and lighting designers. I was having dinner with Ann Militello, mm. rather well-known lighting designer at um, USITT this year, and she reminded me that she spent three years working on the cleaning table, cleaning Lico's at Production Arts. Lighting. Well, originally I hired her to answer the phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And we were encouraging people to work for us for a while, then go off and do something, and then if they wanted to, at the later point, come back and work for us again. There's at least there's one person I can think of who went off and came back at least three times. Other people who stayed their entire career. Yeah, we would hire people, particularly in cable land, to you know coil cable and stuff like that. But then we would encourage them to go out and work on industrials, um, fashion show stuff, and things like that, so that they would learn and understand what they were doing and how it played into the production and so they could see value in what they were doing. Many people did that. But we developed a lot of talented people in, in, in that shop, you know, uh, people who went on to do other things, you know, and had very successful careers, but started in their craft at, at Production Arts, and it's a very re rewarding thing. There's but a Facebook group called When I Worked at Production Arts. Really? Yeah, yeah, alumni kind of sort of <laughs> photographs. And they just, and every six months or four months, somebody will post some pictures that they find or a story that they'll find. So the burning question that I have potentially can be answered on that Facebook group. And that question that I've always wanted to know is, who came up with the T-shirts? There were only actually two big slogan t-shirts. Right. The first one was the logo on the front and then on the back the words same day service with the A crossed out and the O replacing it. So that right. was someday service. I think Peter came up with that. We stole that actually from a Ziggy cartoon. From a Ziggy cartoon, okay. Right. But then we had <laughs> to be a, honest. We had another one that said on the front this ain't no country club. Right. And that was a result of, you know, we, we over the years, we had various people working in the shop, and the clientele or the character of our employee base changed over the years. And at one point, it was getting kind of out of hand in terms of not very productive, and we hired Tommy Ferguson to come in and be the mm. shop foreman. <laughs> and we got him that T-shirt, which right. we handed out to all the well, employees. Well, that was his say. Yes. This ain't no yes. country club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, on my list, the only other thing that we haven't talked about with production arts, that's production arts specific, were the Christmas parties. I never made it to a PA Christmas party, but... Really? I, no, never did. Um, I would have people call me in September asking when the party was going to be so that they could plan <laughs> their holiday travels to make sure they were there on the day that we had the Christmas yeah. party. That, the one year, the one memorable year was that we... we we were sending out so many tours at one point that we couldn't possibly stop and have a party in the factory, in the uh, shop. So we moved the party. We took over the entire three floors of the Landmark Tavern across the street. And it, it, only then did you realize, you know, it was five or 700 people that showed up to this thing. And there was an image of the two of you projected up uh, on yes. the uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> That's a classic. Yes, that's a classic. Ursula. Guys, this has been a great experience. I want to thank you for your time and efforts. Thanks a lot, Bill. Right, thank you. John, Thanks, thank Bill. you.